I friggin' love ultralight backpacking. And not just because I'm a tiny human and practically have no other choice if I don't want to be miserable on the trail. I also love the challenge of seeing how many more ounces I can cut and still enjoy time outside. Yeah, you could describe it as type 2 fun, but I'm okay with that. But if you're new to backpacking or ultralight backpacking, there's probably a lot you're doing wrong that could potentially ruin your trip. I'm talking sore shoulders, sleepless nights, non-functional gear, you name it. So let's talk about what beginners get wrong when it comes to ultralight backpacking and you know, like how to fix it. First of all, if you think that ultralight backpacking is the absolute most uncomfortable way to spend a few nights in the outdoors or you're cutting weight from your pack so drastically that it's putting your safety or comfort at risk, then, well, then you're definitely doing it wrong and probably making most of these mistakes. So let's start with the first mistake beginners make, which is in the gear department. Because isn't that most of what ultralight backpacking is all about anyway? Gear? It's also where ultralight adventures can really go off the rails quickly. Starting with making an ultralight pack, the first piece of ultralight gear that they buy. Yeah, of course it's tempting to dive in and buy a backpack before anything else. It's like the hero of your gear kit. But why is doing that a mistake? Simple. Because while an ultralight pack is a wonderful and surefire way to cut literal pounds off your load, once you commit to an ultralight pack, everything inside of it also has to be ultralight. That's because many true ultralight packs are designed to carry ultralight gear and only ultralight gear. They lack sturdy frames, sometimes any frames at all, occasionally won't have hip belts for transferring weight off your shoulders, and may not have features like load lifters or enough space inside for all of your non-ultralight gear. Basically, if you load up an ultralight pack with traditional gear, it's going to get very uncomfortable very quickly. And that's if all of your stuff even fits inside, because UL packs are typically, though not always, smaller, like in the 35 to 50 liter range. So before you even think of purchasing an ultralight pack, make sure you've already upgraded most of your other equipment first, unless you buy everything all at once, in which case go nuts and go ahead and get the pack too. Also, congratulations, you're now $1,500 in debt. <laughs> I do not exaggerate. Ultralight gear is very expensive. Unless you DIY a lot of your gear, but that's another video. The next thing beginners get wrong is opting for the lightest gear without considering their personal needs, wants, or comfort. For packs, that means don't buy the lightest one on the market if it doesn't have the features you like, like load lifters or a hip belt or extra pockets or hydration reservoir routing. If you've already done some backpacking, you know what features you like. Don't sacrifice that for a teeny bit of weight savings. If you're new to backpacking, try a few different bags out before or you commit or watch reviews or ask more experienced hikers what they like to get a better idea of what might be important to you. But comfort doesn't end with what you're wearing on the trail. Beginners also tend to neglect considering their own comfort after they arrive at camp because Chances are you're spending at least as much time at camp, even if most of that is spent sleeping, as you're spending on your feet. So you're really going to regret over streamlining your kit once you stop moving if you don't have the gear you need to relax and sleep well. Now, I'm not talking about loading a camp chair onto the top of your pack. That's some heavy backpacking nonsense right there. But a closed cell foam pad makes a great insulating seat and does double duty as a sleep pad. And frankly, if a camp chair is a make or break thing for you, then pack it. You like, do what you want. No judgment. If a Thermarest Z-Rest isn't enough for you to sleep on, then don't torture yourself by ditching an inflatable pad. Bring one in addition to a foam pad. Listen, there are some uber light options available these days. You don't have to pick between one or the other. If you can't sleep without an inflatable pad, then you're making a mistake if you leave it at home just to save some weight. The same goes for shelters. Personally, I prefer an ultralight tent that pitches with trekking poles instead of tent poles, but if you're not worried about insects and other critters crawling over your face and body while you sleep and aren't worried about inclement weather, then you do you and pack an ultralight tarp instead. But if you don't want to risk those things, then don't be a hero and pack just a tarp for shelter if you know you're not going to get a good night's sleep. Guys, 
sleep is important. Staying warm is important too. So don't make the mistake of getting a sleeping bag that weighs less but isn't rated for the overnight lows or you will spend a miserably cold night in the dirt. Trust me, you'll be glad you carried a few extra ounces when you're nestled cozily in an appropriately rated quilt or sleeping bag. Along those lines, another mistake new ultralighters make is neglecting to bring enough layers or the right layers. Now, I don't tend to bring an overabundance of clothing with me. If anything, on most trips, I will bring one pair of shorts, one pair of pants if it's gonna be cool, one tech shirt, and maybe a long sleeve base layer or insulating layer if it's gonna be chill. But that all depends on the forecast, because if you don't check the weather before your trip and don't pack sufficient clothing, then you're just gonna make yourself miserable. Adjust what clothing you bring to the conditions that you're expecting. Yeah, I know clothes are heavy, but invest in some good ultralight layers and don't leave clothing at home just to save weight. Those extra layers could very literally save your life. So check the dang forecast before you leave home, okay? The same goes for outer layers and other clothing. If it's gonna be rainy for three days straight, do you really wanna clomp around camp in soggy boots all night? Bring a dang pair of camp sandals. They're worth the wait. Likewise, think good and hard about whether that ultralight rain jacket is gonna cut it in a cool October downpour that lasts for six days because not packing for the weather and by continuation the severity of the weather just to save a few ounces is definitely a mistake. It's more important to choose the right gear and clothing for the job than the lightest gear for the job. And that goes for more than clothing. Like don't trim two ounces by upgrading to a lighter water filter that has a slower flow rate and is gonna clog easier. That's just annoying. Don't buy the shortest phone cable you can find if you plan on using your device while they're charging. Don't leave functional items like a phone case or rain cover for your backpack at home in the hopes that it'll be fine. You will drop your phone and the glass will crack. It's Murphy's Law. It's inescapable. And don't bring the smallest backup battery you have if you're using your phone for digital maps and the dang thing doesn't even recharge your phone one full time. Basically, I'm talking about making sure you pack gear that's right for you not some old white dude on Reddit. And stop cutting your dang toothbrush in half. It doesn't matter. You're literally saving two grams, two grams. What you are doing is making brushing your teeth way more difficult than it needs to be. So just, just stop. Focusing on minuscule weight savings instead of stuff that can cut pounds at a time. So stop obsessing over tiny toothbrushes and ultralight stuff sacks and focus your weight cutting energy on the big stuff. Your tent, your sleeping bag, your sleeping pad, and your backpack. The tiny toothbrushes and stuff sacks can come later. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out our eight and a half pound ultralight backpacking kit review, or maybe the review we did of our favorite ultralight backpacking tent. And be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss our review of the new Ultra Lone Peak, which answers the question, did Ultra just kill the Lone Peak?